Today's message, you asked for quail. You asked for quail. We will be reading from Numbers chapter 11. But before we do, I want to note something, that those who compiled the source material into Numbers chapter 11 have woven two stories together. And for the sake of time, we are going to focus on one of those stories, the story of the quail. And I give that precursor to you so that if you are reading Numbers chapter 11 on your own and you see the story of the 70 elders as part of it, don't be surprised. And now you know why. We are going to focus on the story of the quail in Numbers chapter 11. Reading from Numbers chapter 11, it says, The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat! We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. Remember that? What does that mean again? Our soul has dried up. Remember that in exploring? We've lost our appetite. Our soul has dried up, they say. We never see anything but this manna. Now, the manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in a hand mill or they crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves. And it tasted something like made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on an oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, Give us meat to eat. We've all heard stuff like that before. (laughs) I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I found favor in your eyes and do not let me face, uh, let me face with my own ruin. So God says to Moses, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day, or two days, or five, or ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you, (laughs) we all know what that's like, right? (laughs) Ah, yes. Uh, Where are we again here? (laughs) loathing out of the nostrils, right. (laughs) It's a great picture. (laughs) I can just see pumpkin pie coming out of our nostrils this afternoon. Until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Would they have enough flocks if the flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? And the Lord answered Moses, Is the the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not I will say it will come true for you. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits deep. It's about three feet all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. And all that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 omers, which is approximately 1.6 metric tons. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. 
Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. Hmm. Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> What a great Thanksgiving story. How many of you are having quail instead of turkey for Thanksgiving? <laughs> no? How about some manna pudding? No? Franz had actually said she was thinking of making some manna bread or manna. Manna cookies. She was going to make some manna cooking cookies. She saw what was coming. She says, oh, I'm going to make some manna cookies. Next time, Franz, next time. Did you know that you can still get manna today? Did you know that? Yeah, you can actually go to the Sinai Peninsula in Arabia and you can get it. The scholarly consensus is that manna is the resin from the tamarix gallica plant, a small twiggy shrub or small tree. It will grow to about five meters high. It is indigenous to the Sinai Peninsula and Saudi Arabia. The resin... It oozes out at night. At the same time, the dew settles and falls to the ground. And before it dries, it is wax-like and it melts in the daytime sun. As it dries, it crystallizes white, resembling a wafer-like snowflake. It naturally contains sugar. This is not unlike our maple trees here, and it can taste like honey. The tamarix gallica plant exudes this resin nightly in June and July, and also in reaction to insect attack. Arabs use it for pouring or spreading on bread. It is a hearty plant and is considered a noxious weed and invasive species in non-native areas. It has many benefits and is used as an herbal medicine throughout the Mediterranean, India, the Himalayas, and Europe. It is an anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. It treats gastrointestinal issues and is known to stop bleeding and hemorrhaging. When we first read about manna in Exodus chapter 16. The same story of the manna and the quail is found in Exodus chapter 16. And it describes the manna as wafers made with honey. The passage in Exodus is not as extensive as the passage in Numbers. Today, we are looking at the story as recorded in Numbers. And as you will recall from last week and our series on the Bible, the book of Numbers is made up of a variety of source material with a diversity of dates. So the book of Numbers is a later compilation of much of the same material as the earlier compilation, which makes up the book of Exodus. Now, Numbers, which is written much later, also contains priestly commentary, which has been added to the source material. Having been compiled by the established priestly order in Israel during their time in the Promised Land around the early mid-5th century BC, the compilers had an agenda as to what kind of message the historical material conveyed to their contemporaries. And just like we see in the Gospel writers of Matthew, uh, who is writing to a specifically Jewish audience, he caters his text, the stories of Jesus, to that audience. Mark and Luke are primarily writing to the Gentiles, a non-Jewish audience. So they cater those stories and the details of their stories to that audience. The target audience influences the author and the editors. This is why the same story in Exodus differs from the story in Numbers, in case you were wondering. So here in our passage in Numbers, it starts off with a group of people whining and complaining about not having enough meat to eat. It says in verse 4, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, the rabble with them began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Well, first of all, the rabble refers to a group of people that were up to no good. And we saw this group of people raise their head in the water in the rock passage that we looked at last week. Remember that? 
There's a group of people that were whining and complaining there again. And then earlier, we talked about this group of people that were whining and complaining. Uh, the people who followed Korah, Dathan, Abiram. What happened to them? Well, their families, they were swallowed up in the ground. And now we see this group of people causing trouble again. This rabble. As a result of this group of people, many of the other Israelites started complaining. It's very easy to get swept up in a crowd, isn't it? It's easy to get riled up by a small group. Have you ever seen a small situation get blown out of proportion? Yeah. Crowd momentum can be a great thing or a bad thing. And this group of people who at numerous times try to overthrow Moses and gain control and authority for themselves, are at it again. And many of the Israelites are swept up with them. We need to be careful not to be swept up in mischief. It's much easier to do something naughty when everyone else in the group is doing it, isn't it? <laughs> not that anybody here would do anything naughty. It's much easier to do it as a group. A form of peer pressure, but it's much subtler, isn't it? The momentum of a group, it's subtle. Sometimes we don't even realize we're succumbing to it. You need to think if we do something that we shouldn't as an individual, we stand out. But if we do it as a crowd, it doesn't seem so bad or wrong. Therefore, before engaging in the group, in, in behavior of a group, we should ask ourselves, would I do this on my own? This is why rallies and protests get out of hand. We're seeing a lot of this right now in the States, aren't we? Right? And we saw that actually here in Peterborough uh, at the, the one rally. There was a fight that broke out. Oh, really? Momentum of a crowd. We need to ask ourselves, would I do this on my own? Would those two people in Peterborough this week who were featured there, who got in the fight, would they have ever done that if they were on their own? No, there's no way they would have. Hmm. Rallies can get out of hand. People do things at rallies and protests that they would never do just walking down the street by themselves. So watch out for people who want to stir up trouble. Hey, do you have anything other than this manna to eat? I just wish I had something other than this manna. I'm tired of eating this every day, aren't you? Do you remember what we ate back in Egypt? You know, the spices, the garnishes. Oh, I could sure go for some of that right now. You know, that subtle stirring of inappropriate thoughts? What's the most famous one that we can think of? What's the most famous subtle stirring of inappropriate thoughts? Psst, hey, Eve, did God really say? Right? The starting of trouble. It starts with an inappropriate suggestion and then takes off from there. Have you ever noticed a room full of babies? If one starts whining and crying, the others seem to chime in. Have you ever noticed that? Human nature. We all like to be part of the crowd. And so these people begin to long for the food of Egypt. Now here's the interesting thing. They did have meat. They had meat. Israel was, was known for their flocks, their sheep, their goats, and their cattle. Exodus chapter 13 actually notes this as they're leaving Egypt. It notes how Israel was rich in flocks. Don't you think it's strange that they would complain about not having meat? Isn't that strange? What they longed for were the, the flesh pots of Egypt. The spices, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, the, all the food that was readily and freely available to them. And in verse 4 where it says the rabble began to crave, that word crave means lusted after, coveted, were greedy for. It applies to longing for finer food, the finer things in life, the fine food of Egypt. They wanted the ease of life. They craved for excess in order to indulge this is much more than oh wouldn't it be nice to have something else other than this manna to eat it's much deeper than that the nuance of that word crave is much deeper than that the author of the story further emphasizes this when he says right next to it in verse 6 
But now we have lost our appetite. That Hebrew phrase there that in the English says, but now we have lost our appetite, it actually reads, our soul has dried away. Our soul has dried away. The word for appetite in the Hebrew word there is the same word for soul, nefesh. It means our soul longs for the good things of this world. I'm not getting the things to make me feel good, is what it's saying. This isn't about not having other things to eat, because they did. This was about greed, indulgence, lust for the pleasures of this world. It's a bit difficult to see that in the English, but that Hebrew clearly emphasizes this. And these people had their hearts set on the pleasures of the world for, for, for fulfillment and satisfaction. They did not trust that God was enough. This was about rejecting God and wanting worldly things. Oh. It goes far beyond gluttony. It goes far beyond greed and lust. The key issue is that they were rejecting God. All of those other things were just the, the symptoms of their rejecting God. The pinnacle of the story, the, 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 the very main point of the story is found in verse 20 where it says, You have rejected the Lord who is among you. Doesn't that sound weird? It starts off by just wanting some meat, something different to eat. But at the heart of it, they had rejected the Lord. They wanted the things of the world to make them feel better, not the Lord. You have rejected the Lord who is among you. They're longing for the pleasures of the world. That great food in Egypt revealed their hearts. They have rejected the Lord who was right there. They had embraced the Lord. If they had embraced the Lord as their true joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment, they would not have had such longings. Even with the Lord's presence in the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, the people would not turn their hearts toward him to be their all-sufficient provider. They did not trust that God knew their desires, did not trust that he was good enough to fulfill them, and therefore they coveted. That's why they longed for, that's why they craved, that's why they were greedy for the pleasures of this world. Their hearts betrayed their rejection of the Lord. That's what's really going on in this passage. You see, the desert, it was supposed to be a time of letting go of this world, a time of savoring their fellowship with God, a living God who had delivered them from Egypt, met them in the desert, sustained them, revealed his presence, and invited them to enter into his joyous presence. God had delivered them in order to fellowship with them, to reveal himself to them. And the desert was the perfect place for that. It was free from distraction. It was free from indulgence. The desert wanderings resemble the spiritual call to fasting, Limiting ourselves, avoiding indulgence, restricting certain pleasures, like food. Fasting highlights how much we look to something for comfort, to satisfy the soul as well as our belly, to be fulfilled. The idea of fasting is to, to strip away our common pleasures, recognize how we look to them instead of God and renew a focus on God. The purpose of fasting is to draw closer to God, to help, help us recognize and to let go of those things that we believe we need. The Israelites again fail in this. And they cry out, they wail for these finer pleasures of Egypt. Their time of fasting, it was supposed to encourage them to look to God trust him to be their greatest joy. The question to us then is, do we believe that God is our greatest joy? Do we really believe that? Hmm. Too many times we, say, we see ourselves in the Israelites, don't we? Yeah, too many times. You know what? There is nothing wrong with enjoying the things God created for us to enjoy. 
So I don't want you to leave here and look at that pumpkin pie and go, well, Pastor Chad said I shouldn't eat that. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying at all. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God created us to enjoy. But greed, covetousness, dethrones God from the seat of our hearts. We become consumed with getting what we want. We hurt others in order to get what we want. God understands that. He's not a killjoy. He designed the world for us to enjoy. We are meant to derive pleasure from it. And he hears the whining and decides to give them what they want. Why does he do that? In order to reveal the greed in their heart. Reading from verse 31, Numbers chapter 11, verse 31. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits deep, about three feet, all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 omers, about 1.6 metric tons. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava, graves of craving, because there they buried the people who had craved, who had coveted and were greedy for other food. There was just no self-control. It was pure indulgence. Earlier in verse 20, God says he will give them meat for an entire month. But the people were eating it like they were never going to see it again. They were shoveling it into their mouths. Quail. They are a migratory bird. Has anybody here ever had quail? Yeah, it's quite tasty, isn't it? It was um, King Henry VIII's wife. I forget her name, but when she was pregnant with King Edward, who took the throne next, she just craved quail all the time. That's all she wanted was quail. It's a little side note there. There was no self-control, just pure indulgence on quail. These quail would have been migrating from Africa up to the Mediterranean area. Even today, they are still hunted as game there. Now, quail have an incredible reproduction rate. At the age of six to eight weeks, they are able to breed. Wow, it's pretty fast, isn't it? And they will lay six to 12 eggs, which take 16 to 18 days to hatch. Right? And then imagine that. Then six to eight weeks after that, they're having more eggs. Quail are prolific. So it may be difficult for us to imagine such a flock of birds. But did you know that we had a very similar thing here in North America with the passenger pigeon. Has anybody here ever heard of the passenger pi pigeon? Yeah. Now extinct, the passenger pigeon, due to overhunting, early accounts of passenger pigeon dwell on the vast numbers of them. People noting how the sky darkened when a flock went by. That's how many of these passenger pigeons there were. In 1771... There were 50,000 passenger pigeons that were sold at one Boston market. 50,000. They were often used for their meat and especially their feathers for pillows. They were a great resource in North America. They were also used for, can anybody guess? No, those are homing pigeons. They were used for skeet shooting, right. <laughs> skeet shooting, target practice with shotguns. Because of their sheer number, the birds were collected and used for target practice. This is where we get the term clay pigeon from. You know those round clay discs used for skeet shooting? They're aptly named for their predecessor, real pigeons. <laughs> so God causes a very similar flock such a flock of quail on their migratory route up north to land in the camp of the Israelites. As the people gorge themselves on quail, they notice some of them aren't feeling so good. Hmm. Maybe they just ate too fast. But then they noticed something. People started dying. It's likely that they died 
from quail poisoning. Sometimes the meat from quail can be poisonous, with approximately one in four people being susceptible to it. It's called cauterism and causes muscle cell breakdown and kidney failure. So the question is, did God cause the plague? Or was it the natural outcome of overindulgence on quail, which is known to cause poisoning? Mm. That's a fancy question, isn't it? The sheer indulgence would have led to a buildup of poisoning in one's system, leading to the muscle tissue breakdown and leading to kidney failure. Did God cause the plague, or was it a natural consequence of their indulgence? Well, there's nothing wrong with quail, but an overload can kill you. There's nothing wrong with a glass of wine, but too much. And alcohol poisoning can kill you. There's nothing wrong with food, but too much can kill us. Heart disease, diabetes. There's nothing wrong with sex, but unbridled indulgence can lead to disease and can actually kill people. Hmm. Craving, greed, indulgence, covetousness. It ruins the ability to enjoy what God has created for us without hurting ourselves. Hmm. All of these things are wonderful for, that God created for us to enjoy. But grasping at the meaning, that indulgence, it ruins the pleasure that God intended for us. Isn't that interesting? Here, have some meat. Now you're going to make yourself sick on it. So much so some of you will die. Hmm. The editors of this story, the priestly cast of Israel, they have an agenda. A message that they want to teach the people of their time. So what do they do? What do these editors do? They pull out the ancient stories and source material, right? So they look at Exodus and the source material. They edit it. And then they compile it to teach their lessons. They have two lessons in particular. Two truths that they want to teach the people of their time. Is one, God keeps Israel safe. And two, therefore we need to listen to him. So the priests are trying to say in their day in the book of Numbers. Right? They want to encourage the people to follow the law. At that time, you know, the early 5th century... They see the people wandering. Ooh. So they add some edits to encourage people to follow God. Interesting. Greed is not good for us, they say. We hurt ourselves. How many of you have indulged in something only to regret it later or the next day? <laughs> it's a lot of little hands going up, I see. <laughs> yes, I'm just as guilty. I, let me tell you, I can clean off an entire cheesecake from black honey all by myself. They really do have the best cheesecakes. And a box of cookies. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, it's great going down, but after my stomach is screaming at me, what were you thinking? I don't know. I'm going to do it again next week, though. <laughs> or, or how about a 1.5 liter tub of ice cream? Yep, just give me the bucket and a spoon. <laughs> Has anybody here ever had one drink too many? Or two or three too many? <laughs> no, not here. <laughs> no. Have you ever struggled with trying to lose weight? You want to, but you just can't stop eating those things you shouldn't. People ask me, how can you go to the gym so much? Well, if you saw what I ate, you'd know why. <laughs> we all laugh because we know it's true. How about the workaholic, right? They neglect family and relationships. Why? They can't get enough money. How about the greed in this world that causes inequality? People just can't stop themselves from wanting more, for chasing more, even at the expense of others. The priestly caste of Israel wants to warn the people of Israel of the dangers of greed. So they ascribe the quail poisoning to a plague brought on by God. Isn't that interesting? The priestly caste of Israel 
wants to warn the people of Israel the dangers of greed, so they ascribe the quail poisoning to a plague brought on by God. Edgar Park, in the Interpreter's Bible Commentary, points this out. He says, We see how the priestly writer has used the old story, modified it, and added to it in order to enforce the regulations of his day. Hmm. So consider with me that the plague is not God causing people to die. The plague is God letting them have their way. That's a big difference, isn't it? The plague is not God causing people to die. It's God letting them have their way. You know what? Many times in the Bible, the plagues of God and the wrath of God is simply His letting us go our own way. He sees that we insist on doing it, so He lets us. You know, many of those bowls of wrath in the book of Revelation are nothing more than consequences of environmental disaster brought on by humanity's mismanagement of it. Well, there's a neat perspective, isn't there? Hmm. And we will look at this more in November in our series on eschatology, the study of the end times. But this plague is brought on by their own indulgence. This quail is supposed to last you a month, but you shoveled it in as fast as you can. You indulged yourselves and therefore made yourselves sick to the point where some of you even died. The plague was the natural outcome of overindulgence. God provided, but couldn't stop them from hurting themselves. It's interesting to how God works with and through His creation. Consider the quail, a natural flock of migrating birds. God influences this natural occurrence of the flock by causing a wind to blow them towards the Israelites. You see, the flock didn't just magically appear. Neither did the manna. It's a naturally occurring source of food in the desert region that they were wandering. And God brings to their attention to it so that they know how to eat it. How many here thought that manna just dropped out of heaven and just appeared? Yeah. That's, that's what we're always taught, right? And if you read the number story carefully, it actually doesn't say the manna came from heaven. FYI. But God provides naturally through the means. He draws their attention to it. He says, Psst, over here, try this. God works with and through nature. The priestly order uses these naturally occurring phenomena to emphasize God's provision for the people. Coart Rylardsdom, in the exegesis on the story of the manna, he notes this. All the tamarisk trees in the entire wilderness could not possibly have provided such amounts of manna so regularly for 40 years as this account implies. But this would not have disturbed the narrators, for their concern is to drive home the point that God keeps Israel safe. To do this, the narrators develop certain aspects of natural life until they are blown out of proportion when considered as sober fact. Isn't that interesting? This is typical ancient literature. We see this with Moses striking the rock from water, which we looked at last week. Remember that story? Hmm? You know, God says, you know, people need water. All right, Moses, go and speak to this rock. Instead, he struck it twice and water came forth. Did you know where there are mountains, there is water? Has anybody heard that phrase before? Where there are mountains, there is water. Where there is rock, there is water. It's just a natural phenomenon. So God leads Moses, where? To a rock, which he knows contains a natural spring. God works with and through creation. You see, the overlap of nature and divine intervention creates a very blurred line, making it difficult to discern the divine influence in nature. And so the writers, the compilers, and the editors of Numbers wants to emphasize the divine influence portion in order to encourage the people to trust God. Yet every day, I believe God manifests himself to us in subtle ways, many of which we miss. Have you ever said, oh, that's a consequence? Have you ever said that? Hmm? 
little happenstances, a mental nudge, an inclination, the subtle moves of God's Spirit in our lives. God is always with us, guiding us. Just as Acts 17, 28 says, in Him we live and move and have our being. We don't realize it. You don't realize it. I don't realize how much God has His hand on us. It really is incredible. And we become in tuned to this. God reveals Himself to us. He's always here. It's just so wonderful when He reveals Himself to us. But the people didn't listen to this move of God's Spirit, and they indulged. As a, result, as a result, some of them died from quail poisoning. Now keep in mind, God's ways are meant to save us from harm. Hmm? To save us from harm. Not to be vindictive or to be a killjoy. He wants good things for us, but knows that we will do harm to ourselves and others when we don't trust Him. Our final consideration before we close is Moses. Moses is exasperated from leading the people. He's tired. He's emotionally exhausted. Last week, we saw this at the rock where he struck it twice. That wasn't just any outburst. Tension had been building for a long time. This story of the quail and the manna comes before that outburst at the rock. We see it here in Numbers 11 as Moses points out to God that leading the people out of Egypt wasn't his idea, but God's. Moses basically says to God, look, they're your people, not mine. You do something about it. He's exasperated. So God, in his gracious understanding, says in verses 18 to 19, God says, I will give you meat and you will eat. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. You want meat? I'll give you meat, God says. Hmm. And I love the response of Moses. He says to God, well, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. Okay, 600,000 men who are meat eaters. This is not even mentioning the women and the children as well. Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? If we kill all of our animals, there still wouldn't be enough, Moses is saying. Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? <laughs> Moses is like, oh yeah, God? How are you going to do that? Show me. Oh Yeah? Have you ever met those people who respond to everything you suggest with, oh, how are you going to do that? Oh, there's no way that you can do that. Oh, don't even think about it. It's not practical. It's not doable. You'll fail. Those kind of people really get under my skin. <laughs> there were a few people who, you know, we were all excited to have our baptismal service here. Emily's was our first baptismal service. And they're like, oh, well, where are you going to have it? Well, at Market Hall. Well, how are you going to do that? <laughs> I don't know, I said. <laughs> I'll figure it out. I don't know. And it worked out, right? It worked out. You know what? I see the logistics. I see the practical side. I see the challenges. But faith wouldn't be faith if everything was laid out. You know what? I don't have all the answers, but I know who does. Moses, he's having a crisis of faith here. Moses is pointing out all the practical reasons why it's not possible to give the people meat for a month. Can you imagine one of us telling God why, why it's impossible for him to do something he wants to do? <laughs> That's what's happening here. Even if they slaughtered all their flocks and fished every day, there wouldn't be enough to feed everybody meat for a month. Hmm. How many times have the practical issues of life overshadowed an opportunity of faith? Hmm. I love God's response to Moses in verse 22. Is my arm too short? I love that. God turns to Moses. Why well, is my arm too short? Are you kidding me, Moses? After all you've seen me do, you doubt me. Whoa. Hang on a minute. Uh, you just sit back and watch this. You know, sometimes... My wife, Sasha, will want something done around the house or something moved, right? It's okay. I asked her about this before. It's okay. 
And she'll say things like, would you call my dad or, you know, your friend Todd to come over and help you lift that pot onto the back deck? Or she'll say, oh, you shouldn't lift that. That's too heavy for you. I'm like, whoa, have you seen my arms? Come on, check this out. Now, they may not be as long as the Lord's, but they can certainly do some damage. Whoa! You know something? When I was starting this church, I actually had somebody say to me, oh, you can't do that. People aren't interested in going to church today. It will fail. And another person said, why are you starting a church when so many are closing? That's just a bad idea. By the way, I'm not doing this alone. We are not doing this alone. The Spirit of God, I believe, is with us. Here we are, almost two years old, a handful of people worshiping God in a state-of-the-art facility. Like, really, we are incredibly blessed to meet here. And we're steadily growing, slowly, but steadily. I think that's pretty amazing. That's not to say that I or we won't have times of discouragement or struggle with faith or sometimes feel burnt out. Moses did. I mean, here's a guy who saw God do amazing things and then turns to him and says, well, how are you going to do that? Even the best, most faithful have moments and find themselves lacking faith. I love the brutal honesty with which the writers portray Moses. By including this narrative of Moses' response to God, they are saying, in spite of ourselves, God will accomplish what he wants. God will accomplish his agenda, even if we don't see how. And so may this story of the quail remind us to look to God in faith. He is the satisfier of the soul. Identify our unhealthy cravings that hurt ourselves and others. Turn from greed and believe that God is all sufficient. And finally, may this message encourage us to believe that God's arm is long enough. He can make it happen even if we don't see how. God is with us, something to be thankful for. Happy Thanksgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this story. May it resonate in our hearts to know that you are our all provider. Lord, show us how we reject you in different ways in our hearts throughout the day. Lord, we don't reject you. We want you. We're here today saying we want you. Show us and reveal to us the things that get in the way. And Lord, help us to recognize and believe in your great arm. Thank you that you just accomplish what you want regardless of whether or not we believe. Your love is amazing. Jesus, thank you for accomplishing what we needed by going to the cross and providing that salvation for us. We have so much to be thankful for. May we go today celebrating this thankfulness for each other, the fellowship with each other, and you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.